And uh, yeah, the next talk is going to be not really about Osmocom. Um, it's rather a, um, a niche or related topic, um, which is really about a bit of uh, radio frequency planning. I'm absolutely not the expert in this. Um, I don't really feel very qualified to talk about it, but still, I think for the fundamental uh, concepts, uh, my knowledge is sufficient. Um, is anyone in this room who is actually doing actual frequency planning for radio networks? Done You've done it, okay. Um, okay, um, because what we see quite a bit in terms of the user base is that, okay, there's some people who manage to uh, download or install or compile or somehow configure and use the Osmocom uh, GSM stack or GPRS or whatever it is. Um, uh, but uh, when it comes to actually deploying the network itself, there's a lot of, I mean, these people, they, they might have Linux sysadmin skills and so on and so on, but there's often a lack of understanding of some basic radio concepts in order to install that. And uh, interestingly, also, it's not apparently not always easy to find somebody who can help them there, um, or at least they think so. So um, I thought I'd, I'd introduce some basic concepts. So of course, in radio planning, there are many, many different parts of radio planning. I mean, first of all, there is uh, the, the question about uh, path loss and link budget, on which I'm focusing here, which basically is making sure that the signal really reaches where it's supposed to reach. Um, or evaluating what kind of equipment do I need uh, or to reach a certain uh, destination or the other way around, what kind of equipment do I need to reach the destination or yeah, how far can I go with my signal. Um, then, of course, there's all kinds of other aspects in, in, in real network. There's uh, issues of interference management. There is uh, issues of um, uh, neighbor cells uh, interfering with uh, with other cells, so you have uh, down tilt of antennas and so on, and so you can go on forever. Um, but as I said, I'd, I'd really like to look a bit at the, the basic um, uh, part of how uh, you handle this. Um, uh, there's going to be a lot of talk, a lot about, lot of talk about uh, DBMs and DBIs and uh, watts and so on. So these are basically the the units of measurements uh, that we use. And um, what we focus on right now in this talk is uh, something called path loss. And path loss is basically, as the name sort of implies, the amount of loss that your signal encounters along the path between point A and B somewhere. So your point A might be at your base transceiver station output, so at the coaxial connector back here is, let's say, point A. Um, and then there is maybe some cabling, there is an antenna, uh, there is the actual radio link, there is another antenna that receives it, which is built into this phone, for example. Um, there's no cabling inside the phone, um, but then anyway, the phone at some point um, receives uh, the signal. And uh, the overall loss uh, between the transmitter output and the receiver input is the path loss that we encounter. Um, and um, yes, GSM operates in frequency duplex, so the uplink and downlink frequencies operate in different parts of the frequency spectrum. They also behave slightly different, um, because even though it's only uh, uh, several tens of megahertz, already the propagation uh, can uh, be different between those two. So actually you have uplink path loss, which is the path loss from your phone to the network, and you have downlink path loss from the network down to the phone. Um, and they also need to be considered separately because the sensitivity um, of your receiver in the phone is different than the sensitivity of your receiver in a base station. And what does sensitivity mean? Sensitivity means the amount of signal required in the receiver to still be able to decode the signal properly. So Typically, a base station, since it's a professional-grade equipment, has a much higher sensitivity than the phone, which is a consumer-grade equipment manufactured at much lower cost and, and uh, you know, in, in lower power margins uh, in terms of electrical power consumption and so on and so on. So you have to look at that separately because the different sensitivity um, and um, also the, the transmit power of the devices differ in the both directions. So let's see. So the, the, the most simple... Uh, path loss to look at is the so-called free space path loss um, and that basically is path loss in uh, outer space in a vacuum where there's nothing in between, there's no particles, there's no water molecules that, that sort of attenuate the signal and so on. So there's basically nothing in between, no buildings, no nothing. 
Um, that's free space path loss. So free space path loss is relatively easy to um, to compute, but it's also not very useful because I mean, unless you do, I don't know. Uh, um, I'm not sure whether it's useful if you do uh, communication with uh, the Voyager probe um, or something like that. But at least in terms of GSM communication uh, with Osmocom, I don't think free space path loss is terribly important. So what do we do? We need to somehow estimate the path loss in a given real-world situation. And there's many different approaches how you can do this. Um, if, you do, if you go to operators uh, today that do like real network planning, um, uh, they, of course, they have uh, this, like a specialized industry that produces software tools for, for uh, the coverage analysis. And they use like really high detail 3D geometric data of the buildings and of the, the, the terrain of the land. And then even maybe today uh, using ray tracing uh, uh, methodology. So basically they actually like ray tracing, uh, you know, that maybe from rendering, uh, it used to be popular some, some decades ago as a method of, of rendering graphics. And uh, that basically you were tracing the, the path of a, a simulated light source. And I mean, a, a radio source is nothing else. It's a source of electromagnetic waves. So you basically try to compute as many uh, waves uh, possible and see where they get reflected and what, where they get attenuated and so on. And, and then you, you have uh, some real realistic estimates. But most people who build networks um, with Osmocom don't have access to such technology, so basically we have to go back some decades and use the, the more simple rules of thumb that are available, and um, I'm getting to this uh, very shortly. So, but generally, what kind of things impact our, our path loss? Well, there is the height of the antennas, both on the receiver and the transmitter side. There is, uh, whether it's line of sight or non-line of sight operation, line of sight, of course, is much easier um, than non-line of sight, like here, reception is very bad in the basement, of course. There's no line of sight to any base station. Well, this one, yeah, but not out there. So that's why you should install Osmo BTS-based devices everywhere. Um, uh, the geography terrain of the, the region, do you have hills, do you have mountains, um, out of which material maybe even to some extent. Uh, also the, the vegetation, particularly the foliage, the, the leaves, because they contain water. Um, even the, the attenuation is different uh, if, if you're in a forest or you have signal traverses the forest, whether it's winter or summer, at least in you know, non-equatorial uh, non, um, uh, non regions where you actually have seasons uh, and uh, in winter there are no leaves on the tree, the attenuation is different than in, in, in spring or summer when you have lots of leaves. Um, then, of course, any type of construction and the type of materials used in that construction, height of buildings, distance, the frequency band, most importantly, which is why frequency bands in lower spectrum, like 850 megahertz, 900 megahertz GSM, are much more valuable than the 1800 or 19 megahertz bands, because the signal propagation in the lower frequencies is, of course, much better. And um, so all these factors determine the actual attenuation of the radio wave, but then we also have another aspect which I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here, which is called the multipath fading, which uh, happens because there's multiple paths that a wave travels between sender and receiver. So you have reflections, like let's say between uh, the room and here, there's a, a direct signal propagation. There's one that bounces on the left wall, then goes to the right and goes back there and so on. So you have these, um, basically the receiver doesn't receive one uh, wave, but it receives an infinite number of waves uh, over an infinite number of uh, propagation paths uh, that get reflected. And the reflections mean that the transmission, uh, the, the, the distance is longer and therefore there is a, a time shift between the individual wave fronts when they are received in the receiver. And that really uh, is, is causing an effect called multipath fading and typically in those simple models you just add a couple of dB more margin in your, in your equation to cover for that loss, that additional loss that the multipath propagation uh, uh, does. So over the decades, people have done all kinds of models. As I said, uh, there are these expensive proprietary tools. But I mean, we have some, some general rules of thumb that we can use or some models. Um, let me actually make that slightly smaller so we can fit it on one slide, hopefully. Yeah, like this. So um, there's a couple of different models that uh, the ITU um, developed for uh, radio planning, specifically in the GSM bands. This was the early days of GSM when they didn't have the 3D ray tracing tools. 
Um, and there is basically a terrain model. There is a one woodland terminal model. I like, I like that word. So the, the idea is that um, basically one terminal, normally the phone, is inside a forest and the antenna is outside of the forest, either by height or because it's actually literally outside the area covered by the forest. So you have the base station antenna in the open space and the terminal inside the forest, and that's the one woodland terminal model. Um, so, um, and you have these by type, so you have a terrain model that just tries to cover the, the terrain, the, the geography, you have the rural foliage model with, which tries to estimate the losses you have in, in terms of trees and, and vegetation, and you have multiple city models uh, divided in urban, suburban, uh, open, and so on. And not all of the models exist for, um, uh, for all the frequency bands, so you have to be careful there, you cannot use all of the models in all frequency bands. And then you have, in the city, you see you have all these Okumura Hata and uh, uh, other modified models, such as the COS-231 Hata model, and then there's also a Walfish Ikegami model. Uh, they have, they're always named after the, uh, the, the inventors of those models, or the people who came up with. And they're actually very simple. How do you come up with such models? Well, basically, you take lots of measurements, and then you try to find an equation, find a relationship, a mathematical relation, and uh, put a formula that uh, sort of reflects the, the observations that you have seen. So this is not a, a, you know, a deterministic model, but it's just based on observation and trying to model the, the real-world ob observations. So uh, there are some references um, uh, about the path loss models. Um, you can find it in the slides, and also there is a, a chapter in the Osmo GSM manuals um, which contains all this and, and more text associated with it. I put it in there. So it's, I think it's not really rendered into any of the manuals yet, but all the text is there, um, and I'm still wondering where to actually put it or whether it's yet another manual. Okay, so if you look at the RF power in the wires link, we have the signal strength in dBm, that's uh, decibels uh, um, uh, for milliwatt uh, in uh, the, the transmit uh, side here on the y-axis, and on the x-axis we have the distance. So our transmitter transmits some signal into a cable. That's the cable that feeds your antenna. And the signal sort of effectively gets weaker as it passes along the cable because cable has a lot of loss. Then you have an antenna and the antenna has a gain. So basically instantaneously in this model your, your signal gets much stronger and then you, it gets emitted with something called the EIRP, the Effective Isotropic Radiated Power. Um, that's also, again, a hypothetical idea of how much better your signal is than the idealized isotropic radiator that isn't, doesn't exist in reality. Um, and then over the actual air interface, um, you have the loss of the signal along this curve. And then again, you have a receiver antenna, which has some gain. So again, instantaneously, your signal gets better. You again have cable losses. Well, in most mobile phones, you don't. But just for the sake of illustration, let's assume you have a car-mounted phone with a cable between the antenna and the phone. And then at some point, you have a certain receive signal length, uh, sig signal, <laughs> signal power. And this here, the, f the dash line is your sensitivity of the receiver. So as long as your signal is significant, on average, significantly higher than the receiver sensitivity, your signal propagation is successful. As soon as you go below this RX sensitivity, you have signal loss at that point. And in order to ensure that it stays mostly above uh, the sensitivity, you have something called a margin. Um, you add that margin when you design the system in a way that you say, well, um, I make sure that my signal is always stronger than that margin, so whatever may happen, maybe there is rain or some, some additional factor that causes more attenuation, or the multipath fading, so I have some reserve in my budget. Um, which brings us to the link budget. And the link budget now uses the path loss to compute or yeah, to basically uh, see uh, what, like put in all the factors and see um, what do we need actually. So we have these antenna gains, we have the, the, the coaxial cable, we also have other parts like duplexes, splitters, maybe some additional power amplifiers, low noise amplifiers and so on. And we put this together. And the simplified link budget equation in the end is basically the received power equals the transmitted power plus all the gains that we have in terms of antenna gain or amplifier gain subtracted by all the losses that we have in terms of uh, cables, uh, cable losses or propagation losses over the radio interface. 
Um, and uh, if we add all this up, um, put this into illustration here, right? So let's say we have a base station that transmits at tw plus 20 dBm. We have a bit of cable that has 2 dB losses. We have an antenna that has 10 dBi gain. Uh, then we have minus 114 dB attenuation over that path. I mean, whatever, we will get to computing this uh, uh, also. That's basically the result of your, your, um, your, your path model. So the, you use the, the, the model, like your urban or suburban or whatever model, um, and it will tell you over five kilometers uh, you have such and such amount of uh, dB. You put that in here. And then again, you have some antenna gain, cable loss, and then you have the actual power. So assuming that, let's say, we have a receiver, a quite good receiver, like you find it in good base stations uh, of minus 109 dBm, sensitivity here and we have a phone on this side that transmits at 20 dBm uh, like if we actually try to resolve this so we have plus 20 minus 2 so we are at 18 then we have 10 we are 28 then we subtract the minus 114 and now I'm not very good at um, <laughs> what is it 86 86 yeah so we had 86 uh, we have another 10 dB here so we are at 76 and uh, so minus 86, yeah, minus 76, minus 2, so at min minus 74. So anyway, we are much higher than our received sensitivity here. So in this particular example, it would work. Sorry? Yeah, anyway, I'm, my math might be wrong, but in any case, um, <laughs> you know, I have a numeric spreadsheet for that. <laughs> Actually, I wrote a numeric plugin for that. So we will get to that. But anyway, so... What do we have here still? This slide, um, yeah, we can skip that. So if we look at the uplink, we have the mobile station, the antenna, the path, the BTS antenna, and so on. This assumes that we have a duplexer, the receiver, and some cable, and at some point we have a BTS. That's outside of the slide, but I can assure you it is a BTS. Um, now, how much power does the phone transmit? Um, the typical transmit power level of all the phones from the late 90s till today, in GSM looks like this. I mean, if you go for really early phones, you can still find 8 watt capable phones, but these are not handheld units, but actually the suitcase type of GSM phones, the portable phones. Um, and um, you can still find with higher transmit power, but this is basically it. So on 900 megahertz for um, for 850, 900 megahertz, most of the phones do 33 dBm, which is 2 watts. Some only do 30. And on the, um, on, uh, oh, sorry, no, this is the other band. Sorry, I forget. So in the high band on the 1800, 1900, most of the phones only do 1 watt. And on edge, it's even much less. So this is the e, E2 a power class for the low band and for the high band has even much lower transmit power. So this basically explains why the coverage radius for edge is smaller than the coverage radius for GPRS. Um, not only is there a more complex modulation where you have higher probability of some bits being detected wrong, but also you have much lower transmit power to begin with, so your signal is much weaker. So um, that's why the most robust communication is in the low frequency bands. So you have better signal propagation and stronger signals by phones that can transmit more power. Um, and if you look at the more modern standards like UMTS and LTE, it's much less. So the, the transmit power of the devices becomes less and less as the radio standards evolve. Um, which to some extent is because the receivers are getting better, but to some other extent it also means you just need many more cells uh, to cover um, your area than in original GSM networks where you had really, really large cells. They also have very aggressive... The newer standards also have very, very aggressive changes in uh, the energy to bit ratio, and that helps. Yeah, that's correct. It's not quite fair. Yeah, wow. <laughs> okay, in the downlink it's pretty much the same. We have the BTS, and the BTS transmit power, of course, depends on the BTS model and hardware that I use, and maybe I use an external power amplifier, and so on and so on. Ah, yeah, I have a fix me on my slide, <laughs> because there was a fix me in the original document that I made the slides from, most likely. So, um, in terms of the sensitivity of the... So, in, in this case, in this direction, um, what I spoke about is the transmit power on the mobile station side, but what scrolled out of this due to the zoom is that 
what's the sensitivity of my mobile phone in the other direction? Uh, oh, sorry, in, of the BTS in the other direction. This is mobile, this mobile station to BTS, yeah. So the, mob, the BTS says, the, the spec for, for 3 GPP specification for GSM says it must be at least minus 104 dBm on the BTS side. In reality, it's more 108, 109 with diversity, maybe even a bit more. That's sort of what you get from, from modern uh, BTS equipment um, on the other end. And in the reverse direction, when the BTS transmits, you check the beta sheet of your BTS and the receiver on the mobile station must be, according to the spec, must be m at least minus 102 dBm. Older phones are also in that direction, but modern phones actually are much, much better. So you e sometimes you see phones that are as good as base stations now in terms of receive sensitivity because of the advances in, in technology in general. So, but yeah, if you want to be on the safe side, assume that minus 102 is the, the sensitivity of the phone. So... That's the, the, the minimum, well, yeah. It's the, yeah, it's, it's the minimum sensitivity in a sense that a phone can always have better sensitivity, so go down to minus 108 or something like that. But it is, uh, so uh, a phone that would only have minus 100 would not be 3 GPU compliant. Well, they probably still exist, of course, but still it's, oh, well. It's, it's, it's not compliant, at least, yeah. I mean, at least, for example, in Europe, you wouldn't be able to uh, declare it CE-compliant um, uh, uh, if you uh, cared about the regulation. So, um, now, what can we do uh, in, in terms of optimizing the, uh, the link budget uh, that we have? So, the link budget, basically, is the difference between um, what we transmit and um, uh, what we receive and the margin we have in there and if we determine that well we want to we want to have a coverage area of let's say five kilometers from from there to here and we run all those figures we use one of these models uh, which I will get back to um, and we put in all the values uh, make a spreadsheet or something and then we see oh no uh, the signal arriving at the phone is minus 120 but the phone has a, a sensitivity of minus 102 so there's like 18 dB uh, difference, so it's not possible to make it. So what kind of options do we have? Well, in the downlink, we can always add a bigger power amplifier um, uh, if we have the, 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 the electrical power available and the, the, the cost of the uh, power amplifier and the, the radiated uh, thermal energy and so on is not a problem. We can increase the power amplifier. And if you look at classic old BTS hardware, you can find BTSs that have 40 or 60 watts of transmit power is like, okay, did they want to roast chicken? Um, so, um, but yes, you can do that. There are reasons for that because they have long cables and basically two thirds are lost in the cable before it hits the antenna and so on. But anyway, um, you can have bigger power transmitter. But the problem is, of course, the uplink direction in the reverse. I mean, you don't want to carry around a large power amplifier with your phone and some batteries, and that's not realistic. Um, and and brain cancer and so. Um, <laughs> Um, so, uh, yeah, you can, of course, uh, try to reduce cable losses. This is a very important factor that many people who have not really looked at this are not aware of, is how much you loss, lose in cabling. So, particularly in classic BTS setups, where you basically have a high tower, you know, a very high tower, and all the BTS equipment is basically on ground level, and then you have lots and lots and lots of cables, like 50 meters cable or something like that. And then, of course, over those 50 meter cables, you lose pretty much all of your signal, and that's not very useful. So, always try to get your BTS as close as possible to the antenna, because then you avoid these losses uh, uh, in the signal. Um, Increasing the height of the antenna also always, well, almost always helps. I mean, certainly not beyond a certain point, but um, that's uh, one of the factors in all the signal propagation models is the height of the transmitter antenna. And uh, the higher you get, the more likely it is, irrespective of terrain or buildings, that you can get closer to or into a line of sight situation as opposed to a non-line of sight situation. Okay, yeah, there's some other stuff that I'm not going to go through. This is just also from this paper about like coaxial cables and coaxial connectors and what you should do and you shouldn't do and what duplexes are and how you can power, power amplifiers in the link and so on and so on. I'm going to skip all of that and rather I'm going to just quickly open this uh, spreadsheet that I made. Um, just two, um, uh, two aspects uh, of that. Um, the 
path loss models that we had originally, the different ones, the, the hilly terrain, the one terminal woodland model and all these funny uh, models. Um, it's not very easy, at least I don't know how to put this in a normal spreadsheet just by entering formula. I, I don't know, I, I don't think it's possible, at least not with the kind of spreadsheet programs I'm familiar with. So what I did, I wrote a numeric plugin, which you can luckily, luckily do in Python. Um, uh, so you don't need to compile and link it against the specific uh, um, uh, numeric version that you have. So numeric is a, a spreadsheet to begin with uh, program. And so there's a, a numeric plugin uh, that I published in a, in a Git repository where uh, which you can load in your numeric. And then I have a spreadsheet that uses that numeric uh, module to, uh, to basically execute all these different um, uh, models uh, to, to estimate the, the signal propagation loss. And then in there I also have the different, like, different antenna types and so on, so uh, let's just uh, have a look at that very quickly. Uh, we'll need a minute or so to open it. So, um, this is too small to read, um, most likely. Now I have to figure out how to zoom in numeric. I don't think I did that really much before. Okay, let's try with 200%. Ah, 200%. Um, okay, so that's... Actually, let me change that slightly. Um, like this, okay. So basically, there's a, a start slide where we say, well, what's the, the, the transmitter power in, in downlink and uplink, the frequency and so on, and it computes uh, various other values. So let's say the uplink here now for uh, 2 watts, which equals 33 dBm. So that's already computed from the, from the 2 watt that you input there. This is the actual um, transmit frequency on uplink. Then we assume we have about 2 dB body loss. That's your human body because you have a hand and a head and so on next to the antenna. Um, we have no duplexer inside the phone and I mean not that not, none that is added external to the phone, let's say. We don't have a, a cable and so on, so we end up transmitting about 31 dBm. Um, on the receiver side, let's say we have no antenna gain, uh, minus 108 uh, dB um, sensitivity and so on. So we end up with a total system gain of, of 138 dB. And then from that system gain, we, d uh, we reduce uh, some factors like the, the fading loss, the indoor penetration, well, in indoor was not uh, uh, used here. And then we have uh, some margin, we, we subtract that and we say, well, the total uh, path uh, loss is 100, uh, or the total link budget is 130.5 uh, dB in this example. Now, this is all the details, but if you use that to compute this, let's say for a, um, this is for a 2 watt base station. Um, again, apparently I have to zoom for each sheet separately. Um, so this is a, a 2 watt uh, BTS, assuming a 25 meter antenna height. Um, and then it computes all the, uh, basically, uh, we have different uh, columns, uplink, downlink for no antenna gain, a 2 dB antenna gain, 5 dB antenna gain, 7, 9 dB, 11 dB antenna gain. And if we look at the estimated coverage that it computes, uh, the font is too large, that's why the first line, well, this is the free space path loss, which is not interesting anyway. So the free space path loss would say, well, you know, you get 38 kilometers in downlink and in 89 kilometers in uplink. And it's like, yeah, okay. Um, uh, but then if we look at these, the, the different propagation models, then we get more realistic figures here, right? So this is without any gain at the antenna. We, we can see that the the... Sorry, what was that? The downlink is first. So we can see that the downlink uh, in a large city would be 750 meters and the uplink would be 1.2 kilometers. So we can see that the link is not, bad, uh, is not balanced. In, in, in downlink, we only get 750 meters, but in uplink, we get 1.2 kilometers, which means um, 
uh, we, we are constrained by the downlink, so we should add more power or more gain to the downlink, so we balance uh, the link that, because we need both-way communication. And this propagates down here, so even if we use a relatively good antenna with, with uh, 11 dB gain, um, we still have 1.5 kilometer in downlink and 2.5 kilometer in uplink, so it's still not balanced. We need more power on the transmit side to get to the maximum range in, in the large city. So if we go for the Sorry, for the one terminal woodland, I think this is the, the second line here. So 2.9 versus 4.5 kilometers uh, with uh, uh, one terminal in the woodland. And if we go to a 10 watt BTS, we will see with these figures that I put in there. Of course, it will not apply to all, but still it should give you some edu educated guess. Um, where was the zoom? So... If we look at this for 10 watts, the same computation, still 25 meter height of the antenna mast on the BTS, 1.5 meter height of the phone, like sort of the uh, level uh, of the phone when you make a call above ground. And if we again look at the 11 dBi antenna uh, here at the end, then we see it's almost equal according to theory. So um, in that case, we see that uh, about uh, 10, 10 watts seems to be a good uh, um, uh, transmit power to, to balance the link, assuming a receiver on the phone hand side that only performs as good as the spec requires it to, right? This is the minus 102 dBm. And basically, the, the, all this difference that we see here, that we because the phone still transmits the 2 watt, but the BTS transmits the 10 watt, that's only due to the fact that we assume the BTS receiver is so much better than the, the, the phone receiver, or to a large extent at least. And um, if the phone is much better, then this of course doesn't work anymore. But you don't know how old or how good the phone is, so if you want to be on the safe side, you can make the, only the assumption that it's as good as the spec requires it to be. Okay, so that's basically um, some short intro into this uh, to, to get some, some educated guess. I mean, this is not more than an educated guess you can get from these kind of simple models, but at least it is something to, to start with if you, if you want to deploy a base station somewhere. Questions? Yeah. Can you find the values for the phones, something like on the FCC where they need to publish the tests? It's a good question. I don't think I have looked for this in terms of specific phones. On a, and I don't really think it's something, well, is it something that needs to be tested as part of the FCC approval? I don't even know that, whether it's mandatory for a phone to, to do the receive sensitivity testing. Uh, I've, I cannot really tell. It would be interesting. I, I could think it is the case, but I don't know. Try for yourself. Check the FCC database and see if you see our uh, receive sensitivity uh, indication. For, for phones, normally, I mean, most consumer phones, you don't get real data sheets. That really sucks. Uh, but if you look at data modules like GSM modems, actually, uh, from a lot of manufacturers, you can get the data sheets. And they have, I've seen from several manufacturers, actual sensitivity figures on there. So um, there it's more likely that you get some, some hard data on, on the, the real technical parameters as opposed to, to consumer phones. Um, okay. Yeah, uh, we need the... The mic, but, but it's still ah oh yeah. yeah. Uh, I just wanted to know if um, there's kind of like an error. All the values are kind of very absolute and very seems very precise, but I, and uh, the conditions are kind of static. I just want to know if kind of like if it's raining, some storm, if kind of this error, if you have kind of a percentage, how the value can can change. Well, you put always some some dB of margin for these kind of things, additional margin normally. So. Uh, let's say for the here on the on the first slide, um, I had uh, where, where basically all the the parameters are described. Um, so for shadow fading, we have here a margin of of seven point five dB, and that's computed again by some other values. And if you want uh, uh, for uh, for indoor penetration, I think you put another three dB or something like that. Uh, I'm, as I said, I'm not the expert on this, but. You can check, and there are some books on 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 uh, radio planning and so on. And if you want to do these kind of, this is all full of errors everywhere. 
I mean, as I said, it's an estimated guess. But I mean, there are also some like standard values to put in there, as I said, for indoor coverage or for for. Uh, but rain is not that big that that big an issue. I mean, we're not talking about the massive amount of uh, uh, difference here. Not at the frequencies that we are transmitting, because it's more of an issue with with Wi-Fi, for example, because 2.4 gigahertz is a, the resonant frequency of clusters of water molecules or something like that. Um, and which is why you use it in a microwave often, um, right? Uh, but uh, GSM frequencies don't. Uh, water, for example, is not a particular. Uh, it's not a resonant frequency or something like that. So Trees, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I just uh, a quick comment um, because. This is this is great. It's really important stuff. I think this and um, you know not not just with cellular, but also FM broadcast or whatever. You know, and during years, I've seen people. You know, with, often without having any specialized test equipment, um, wandering around like trying to figure things out in a in a, in a very non scientific way. So, just a quick comment um, with the, due to the work again of the Osmo community, the RTL SDR. Um, you can plug that into an Android device. And basically, for quite cheaply, um, get yourself a little spectrum analyzer that will give you figures, um, which is a lot better than maybe wandering around your coverage area counting bars on the telephone um, and seeing, okay, I have signal here, I don't have signal there. This, this thing will actually give you um, some numbers if you can standardize your antenna in some way so that you have a reference point, um, then you can map um, if you have an installation, you can actually map it to, to some extent and see what you're what you're actually getting in the real world in in, uh, in in your installation area. That would just. I'm I'm not sure whether RTL SDR is really such an improvement there. Uh, th sure, the signal bars is not as strong, but if you have a monitor mode that gives you the DBM reading, or you like on Android there are apps uh, which give you the the raw uh, value. Of course, the I mean a phone is not a measurement device. So the tolerances that are permitted by the specification for these kind of indications, I think it's also plus minus 3 dB or something. So it's like massive compared to an actual measurement device. Um, but uh, still, I, I think there's not, it's not really bad to use phones for, for doing coverage testing. Just, yeah, the virus is a very rough granularity. But if you can get to the actual uh, receive level, I think it's, 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 it's still good. Yeah. Uh, sorry, sorry, you don't have that mic. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> yeah, I just had a general, I just want to answer the general question about the FCC requirement. Closer, closer. Yeah. Uh, the on the FCC oh, is that not sorry, I think it's not on, is it? Nope. Uh, the LED should be off. No, no, the, the yeah. top LED, the mute, okay. yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay, got it. Uh, positioning of the FCC is that receive sensitivity or performance in general is not tested. So that goes beyond that. That also covers interference from adjacent bands is one example where they also do not test that at all either. So uh, it came up earlier. So that's okay. that. I suppose this is for the phone side. For the base stations, it's probably part of the, 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 the testing or also not. Uh, I do not know about the... I guessing it's probably okay. the same case, actually, hmm. uh, where that would fall under the manufacturing test hmm. uh, okay. for their performance reasons. Yeah. In in Europe, the 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 receiver performance is part of the the CE, so um, uh, but the filings are not public, right? So basically, you need to, as a manufacturer, you need to uh, you need to well, actually you don't need to file it in the first place, right? You you self certify and you have all the documents, and if a regulator ever inquires, then you have to provide the documents. But the receiver performance is a key part of the regulation. So, because they basically want to achieve efficient use of the spectrum, that's the, the, the regulatory goal, and uh, it's, it's just mandating, let's say, the transmitter not to transmit out of band or something like that is insufficient, and that's why there's the strong receiver requirements on the, on the, uh, on, on the receiver. But, uh, yeah, no public information. <laughs> yeah, I can provide one comment on the handset side. The reasoning there is to say the manufacturer can make a phone as cheaply and as performing as as poor, for performing as possible, and if the if the user wants to buy it, then they should be allowed to buy that product. Yeah, I, the assumes the market is 
The FCC testing assumes the market has the utmost incentive to like pursue performance, however it works. So you're right on that. The only numbers that they care about have to do with uh, RF exposure, which is kind of related to all this, but also quite separate. That's the stuff that gets reported on, I think. Okay, yeah, then we're already behind schedule again. Um, we have to switch to the next topic, which is the afternoon break.